I think the last few talks have really been a great lead into what I want to talk about today. Um, I want to give you an idea of, of where um, we're going in, a, in a, what's been a very strange journey. But I want to start with this quote from Grace Hopper. It's one of my favorite quotes. It defines a lot of uh, the science that we do, that the, the most dangerous phrase in the language has always been, we've always, or is that we've always done it this way. And if you think about your life, there's not a lot about your life that has always been that way. We wear different clothes than humans used to. We drive cars, we have the internet, we have implants in our arms now. <laughs> um, but there's one thing left that I can think about in our society um, that is the same as it's always been. And our story starts with our new health education campus. It's gonna be built down the street. This is where all of our medical students, nursing students, dental students are gonna be. Um, but the one thing that's gonna be different about this building is that there's gonna be no cadaver lab. So we have to figure out a way to teach um, people human anatomy without a cadaver. And if you think about it, this is the only thing in our society today that I can think about that's always been done that way. You know, in a way, cadavers and dissection even predate medicine, right? It's a hundred year old tradition, hundreds of year old tradition. And yet in four short years, we're being asked to develop a complete program where this is gonna be gone. So the, the time is right though. We know much more about human anatomy than we used to. We've got great books and great knowledge. And then we can also take pictures of people, let me see if I can play this, with just exquisite detail. So we can go from head to foot in about four seconds and scan, scan your whole body at sub-millimeter resolution. So we started this project by playing, or working on touchscreen tables that replicated the, the dissection experience. And we got really positive results from the first group of students that went through. Um, but it really wasn't enough. If you think about complicated structures like the brain, so this shows some of the white matter um, fiber tracks in the brain. This is an unbelievably complicated set of structures. And even though the rotation gives you a little bit of the idea of what these look like in reality, it's next to impossible for you to fully understand all the details in this without seeing it in 3D. So the problem is that hasn't been possible before. Um, but fast forward to, to one of these strange, random things that happen in our world. Um, Toby Cosgrove, the president of the Cleveland Clinic, was on a boat trip with one of his old friends, Craig Mundy, who at the time was the head of Microsoft Research, also from Cleveland. Um, and Toby was telling Craig about what was happening with the new building, and Craig said, you need to come visit us, and I need to show you something. So they went, um, Barbara Snyder went along, and Pam Davis went along, um, and then I got a phone call about uh, a couple hours after they landed saying, hey, I need you on a plane to Redmond next week. I need you to go to Microsoft. So this was just before Thanksgiving of 2014. And if you think back that far, um, Microsoft was viewed as this old tech company that wasn't going anywhere. Nothing innovative was happening there. And so when I got this phone call, I honestly thought um, this is what I was gonna go see. Um, but what I saw was absolutely the most revolutionary piece of technology that I've seen in probably 25 years. As Caroline uh, mentioned, this is the, the HoloLens. So what this is, is a headset that you can wear, it's transparent, uh, and it projects holograms into your world. And what this means is that there could be something like a holographic globe in front of us, or you could decorate your rooms with holographic weather stations on your countertop or your large screen TV, holographic TV. And this gives you just a completely new way to interact with data and with your world. Um, it's like nothing I've ever seen. Um, and so I saw this in December of 2014, um, and my colleague Jeff Dirk, who's the Dean of the School of Engineering, saw it in April. He saw it on April 1st, and I must have told him 10 or 20 times what this whole thing was gonna be about when he would go see it. Um, so he knew exactly what he was getting into, and he's obviously a very technically savvy person. Um, on April 2nd in the morning, this is the email he sent me. 
It's absolutely my favorite email that I've ever gotten. I'd like to share it with you. Um, subject was last night. I literally could not sleep. Kept saying that stuff is real, not videos, mock-ups, etc. It's real. My sense of when the future will happen has changed. The timeline has to be recalibrated. Blown away, truly, I got maybe an hour's sleep. So I could sit up here for hours and tell you about this. And that experience of doing it the first time is just going to be different. And so I'm going to tell you at the end how maybe you can come visit us. Um, but I'm going to do my best in these few short minutes to try to explain this experience to you. And I'm going to start with my first experience. So we put the headset on. We snapped some fingers and said abracadabra. And suddenly I was on Mars. I could look around. I could see Mount Sharp. I could see all the rocks in the valley. And I could bend down and, and, and see these rocks as if I was there. So I had this immense feeling that I was on a different planet. And then they said, this is software that uh, JPL is using to drive the Curiosity rover around on Mars. And you're never going to make a decision about driving on Mars alone. So let's bring in a scientist. So here it's John. And I, I could see when John, for me it was a guy named Victor, but he, he appeared about 15 feet away from me. And the whole time I had eye contact with him, and he said something that I'll really never forget. He said, hey, why don't you come over here and look at this rock? It was over here. So I walked across the surface of Mars with Victor, and I looked at this rock. And he started telling me about the, the origins of this rock and why they were studying it and why they were interested in it. And so to me, this was my first class on Mars with Victor. And that classroom is really different than the classroom that we sit in today, right? This is, does anybody sit in a different classroom than this, really? It's not too much, right? They haven't changed in hundreds of years. But that was a very, very different classroom on Mars. Let me back up. The video is not really playing. Well, it's not going to play. But um, this is what we see as the, the future classroom. That it's essentially like a museum exhibit where you're going to be able to walk around and see things in your space that don't really exist in reality. They're just digital. And this is a completely new way of interacting with our, the, the knowledge that we need to learn, but also with each other. We can take very complicated things like the human body and take them apart, look at them in their individual pieces, and then put them back together just like uh, at will. We can then take these, these digital pieces of information and animate them and look at how um, they change in time, for example. So you can imagine for people like surgeons, this will dramatically change and enhance their ability to um, both learn a procedure but then also um, perform that procedure in an operating room. Nurses and other support staff can learn how to do procedures before ever seeing a, a real person. But then we can also change the scale of things and understand things in a different way. So th complicated structures like neurons in the brain, we can understand in a different way. We can make some, take something that's very small, blow it up to be very big, and get a full understanding of that 3D shape can go even, even smaller and look at proteins or other molecules throughout our body and understand and, and even better design um, how they work in the body. And then we can, just like I had that experience on Mars, we can take and, and expand these distances, um, expand our interactions out over much larger distances. So this is an example of a father helping his daughter fix a, a, a plumbing issue. But what isn't maybe obvious here is that he's able to draw holograms into her world to actually show her in full three dimensions um, what she's doing. So you can imagine if you're a surgeon or um, someone um, in, in any kind of business who's got to deal with something that, that's uh, very important at a big distance, this is something that you can do um, that we just can't do any other way. 
So we're using this to teach anatomy right now remotely. So I was teaching anatomy on Tuesday in Switzerland. But I was standing there like an avatar like this, um, teaching students on another continent. And they, I can see where they are, just like I could see where Victor was on Mars. Um, and I can interact with them as if they're a student, just like, just like the ones that I have here in Cleveland. We're actually using this today on the space station. So this is a few months ago, Scott Kelly was up there. Um, that's actually them playing a game. But um, they could use this to repair all the parts on the space station. Um, and the people on the ground can guide them as if they're there on the space station with them. And then we can do um, design and, and other tasks um, in our holographic world. So if you think about designing a car or a motorcycle or even a bicycle, um, these are things that uh, are, are um, it's where it's really critical um, to match the individual human that's going to be using it. So if you're designing a bicycle, for example, on a computer or a motorcycle, it's really difficult to translate that into its final human form. I don't know exactly where the mirrors should be on that motorcycle until I build it at least once in reality, and then I can move them around. But with HoloLens and this type of technology, I can build it digitally at full scale. And I can stand next to it and I can say, you know what, I actually want those mirrors to be a little bit higher or at a slightly different angle. And so that when I finally get to the point of building it, I build it once and it's right. And then maybe the, the last example that I'd like to show is from the art world. So this is um, Apollo the Python Slayer. It's the first sculpture you'll see when you go to the art museum inside the gallery. It's a 2,500 year old Greek sculpture. Um, and it's a little bit damaged from its original form. It's got some dents, and it's originally bronze, and you can see that it's, it's got this green patina now. Well, I can scan that like this, and now I have it in a computer, and I can do things like fix dents. So there's actually a dent on his leg right here that's been fixed. And then I can also fix and get rid of the patina. And then I can take him and I can put him where he was originally, in a Greek garden somewhere. And when I put on my HoloLens, now I can get a complete experience of what this sculpture was like in its original place, in its original um, culture, and in a time that's not, you know, it's very far distant from our world today. And so this uh, technology gives us this instant ability to manipulate space and time. So that classroom is very different than this one. This is the one that we still live in. But we imagine, you know, this, this was what that, this classroom was made for these jobs. And that's not the jobs that any of you are gonna do when you leave here. We think that it's this kind of job, this intense personal interaction um, that's going to be the future of, uh, of the really successful, profitable um, um, industries in our world. So it's going to be taking these, these pieces of knowledge from individual areas of our world, connecting them, making new science and new concepts, and then expanding our knowledge of network out from there. And as Caroline mentioned, this is a new initiative on campus um, to house all of these kinds of thoughts called the Interactive Commons. It's actually just outside, so this is what's being, been built on the back of the Twing building. If you just go out that way. And so we think that this is going to be the place where we're going to be able to live up to our, uh, our motto here, to think beyond the possible. Thank you very much for, for coming together today.